Hello everyone. This is Vakas Prachar from Noble Traders, and I shall be the moderator for this session today, which is going to span for about 30 to 45 minutes. The topic for this session is effects of COVID on shipping and rice trade, and it's way forward. With the birth of novel coronavirus, the facet that has been most affected is shipping in the industry of agricultural trade. Exporters saw that the freight already quadrupled from the base rate, but also congestions and severe shortage of containers added insult to injury. In the last leg of 2020, we saw all this happening in full swing. And now despite being in the middle of 2021, when trade has slowed down considerably and enough time has passed since the inception of COVID for things to stabilize, we still are seeing that freights and equipment have not come back to the normal levels. In this session, we're going to discuss what exactly went wrong since the inception of COVID, what is the way forward, and when do we expect freights and equipment availability to normalize? Today in the discussion panel with us, we have industry leading experts in shipping who shall be presenting their views. And then we will have a small discussion where we shall be trying to understand the effects of COVID on shipping and the way forward in rice trade. In the panel with us, we have Mr. Abdul Rahim, who is head of sales, Hepagloid, Pakistan. He's has the diverse experience in logistics, shipping, aviation, and startup. We also have Mr. Mois Tamur, who's a director leading freight forwarding of a leading freight forwarding company, Wild Logistics Pakistan. He has work experience for about 30 years in shipping and logistics and about 20 years directly working in under various different shipping lines. Mr. We also have last but not the least, Mr. Asad Paki, who is a director and chartering manager of Universal Navigation, a Singapore-based company that specializes in dry bulk operating. Um, he has been involved in the dry bulk sector for the last 15 years. As time is of the essence, hence, without further ado, let us move to the speakers and their presentations. We're going to start off with Mr. Abdul Rahim. Uh, Mr. Abdul Rahim, could, could you please, uh, you have the floor now, could you start as you will? Thank you. Thank you, Vakas, for the introduction. So, if you can please put up my presentation. Yes, one second, please. Okay, so the presentation is up. Again, is the presentation up? Okay, so I guess uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and I guess, so first of all, thank you for organizing this virtual rice expo for the first time, I guess. Thank you for the organizers for all the hard work that they have put in. So starting with the topic, and uh, if you can please move to the next slide. Yes. Okay, so I know that this topic is right. You can say the very hot topic there under discussion into the global markets that uh, the impact of the COVID onto the shipping and logistics. So I will try to take a few minutes in describing what has happened and what is the factor that has led to all of this. And then probably in the next few minutes, we will discuss uh, what is the way forward. And then we will uh, go ahead with your question and answer sessions. So if I look at probably the recent one and a half year, we can say the one year uh, precisely. So there are very ups and downs into this shipping and logistics and into the whole global supply chain that has led to what we are today. And uh, due to this frequent changes, there have been quite, you can say the imbalances into the demand and supply. So if we start with probably the quarter one and quarter two, so there was a panic into the global trade markets and we could see that everything was going down and there was a lot of uncertainty. We could see that a lot of orders getting canceled from the different buyers, especially from the retail ones, went to the Europe and USA and everything looks that uh, everything will go down the drain. So that all, it started from there. And then what we could see is basically in quarter three, there was an immediate rebound which was not uh, predicted earlier. So what happens is basically once we had this immediate uh, rebound, so nobody was prepared. Even the production was not prepared, even the shipping was not prepared, even the transportation was not prepared for this surge. And what led to this surge is basically accepting, first of all, that the COVID will remain for a longer term than it was anticipated. Like initially everyone was expecting that this is something that we can get over probably within a week's time but then identified that economies cannot sustain and then we need to find a way to come up with the business practices. And then everyone started uh, reordering. So this created a lot of panic once again onto the upside of the business. 
So that was the first part of it. And what we could see is basically one of the reasons was the stimulus offered by many countries into the Europe and USA. And due to the stimulus, demand rebound and the bounce back. So there is one thing. Second part is once this happened, there was a, you can say, the severe equipment imbalance into the global trade. Like once the China was closed, equipments were struck and the equipment was struck in the different parts because of this COVID thing. And once the trade rebound, equipments were not at the right places. So in order to have this imbalance to come up with a balance, it took a lot of time for all the, you can say the carriers and the ports. And this is still, you can say not very ideal as of today. What we could see is basically there's equipment requirement here and there, but the equipment is not at their ideal locations, which used to be pre-COVID. So this is still prevailing and impacting the global supply chain. Second is basically, you can say the COVID restrictions. Uh, still, we could see that there is a lot of, you can say the COVID restriction in place at the port side. And there are, you can say the delays in cargo loading and offloading. And this is one of the reasons is basically the workers. Not all the workers are reporting at the port side. And this is also delaying the, at the clearance of the cargo and the unloading of the cargo. If you look at probably the recent statistics into the well, Los Angeles and the Long Beach, which is on the West Coast side, it's still probably, I guess, 20 containers are out waiting for their turn. And if that happens, the whole cycle gets delayed, resulting in probably the supply chain delays for everyone. So this is one of the things. And what we could see is basically once we are getting back to this track, the production, there was an overproduction because the orders were canceled in the beginning, but then there were production delays because of the staff shortages. One or the other gets COVID, and then you can say the business was not as smooth because of these staff shortages and this COVID cases reporting at every level. And then we could see is basically due to this COVID, there were frequent changes in the country regulations. Like every country has their own regulations. Some were allowed for the birthing. Some were uh, asking for the 14 days quarantine for the crew members. And that all leads to the last point of the onboard and offshore support, onshore support. So the traveling to the port was also restricted and there's a lot of support required when they were birthing. There's an onboard as well as onshore support that was also impacted severely into this part. So this is, the, you can see the primary, you can see the background of what happened and what are the reasons. And also one of the things that happened uh, in the recent past is basically the kind of the commodity that are being shipped because people were at home due to the COVID, work from home and everything. So the kind of, you can say the consumables that were required were different. So that also created a lot of, you can say the commodity imbalance as well. So this is why we could see that there was a sharp increase in the freight for some trade lanes. And, uh, and what we could see is basically, and if you look at all the forecasting reports that the demand surge that we were expecting is just temporary because of the stockpiling or something, restocking is not the, the case. And we could see that there is sustained demand growth that will continue for the future as well. So while talking about this, let's move towards the next slide where we could see what's the way forward to this, because that's more important right now. What has happened has happened. So what we could see is basically the exploited digitization. That's the first part. What we have seen is basically now the many processes into this logistics are digitized already. And there are many in process that we that all the stakeholders are working at how we can digitize this. One of the important uh, discussion that is going on with all the, especially the terminals, is a smart network strategy where we can have the AI-enabled uh, softwares that can probably do the lot of, you can say, the remote control equipments that can help uh, uh, doing the jobs in a more efficient way. That is one thing that is already under discussion and being implemented and at all the levels. Second is basically the port volatility, increased port volatility that will continue what we see. Like the recent, we had the Swiss Canal thing and probably what we are expecting is next is the Antian where 50, can, 50 vessels are waiting for the birth. And that could lead to a probably a, we can say the bigger mess in the near future. So increased port volatility that also includes that let's, if there is a delay at one port, then in order to have the scheduled recovery, shipping line has to escape the other ports, which means that there will be pile of, of, of cargo at the one port or the other. And that also increase the transshipment uh, volumes in, at many areas. So which means, let's suppose if it is a Karachi or it is a Jabal Ali, if we have the cargo for the transshipment port uh, for the last week as well, which means 
there is a lot of port volatility also and port also needs to be more efficient in handling you can say the unplanned cargo as well further what is happening is what what will continue to happen in the near future is basically you can say the delays in the vessel which means delays in the berthing and ports are also not we can say the very used to for this part of this where the berthings are usually very scheduled and if it gets delayed by one day or two day so it's also affect the whole of the operation and the next ships in queue as well so there is something that probably will continue uh, for the near future as well and third part is basically the inland transportation what we have witnessed is basically due to all of this you can say the imbalance into the demand and supply or you can say at some weeks there is a more cargo at some weeks there is a less cargo which is piling up of the cargo which is having a severe challenges into the inland transportation uh, just to give you a rough estimate on this one so like suppose in in us where we have a lot of inland transportation from the base ports there is a truck power shortage and you can say there is one almost one truck for 20 containers for now so there are huge delays as well into this inland transportation as well and second that is leading to this is basically the storage and warehouse capacity that is being witnessed at the shipper end as well as at the buyer end so at one point probably there is a over capacity in terms of like the warehouses are full and at one point warehouses are empty so that is also leading to a lot of problem into the supply chain and the git because things are not going as planned due to all this you can see the bottlenecks that we have into the system right now because everything is linked up so what needs to be done is basically the greater use of the integrated transport services as of today there is no integration into the transport services we have like origin transport that is not linked with the ocean ocean is not linked with the inland transportation at the destination so that's all probably needs to be done in a more efficient way the way forward and last is basically the flexibility into the supply chain that's all i guess we have witnessed that relying on the one part is not working and relying on the one supplier is not working so we need to have the flexibility into the supply chain moving forward to have the business continuity if you look at the article for regarding the semiconductor and the raw material everything is severely disrupted because there is no flexibility into the supply chain because of the heavy reliance on one or two suppliers and if it gets stuck due to the production due to the shipping or due to any other factor into this into the value chain so it is severely impacting at the end of the the consumer products so these are all the factors and what we could see and if you look at the near future so we expect that the volatility will continue for now so let's hope that it gets better soon and once we move towards the question and answer session i will try to explain more details if you have any questions on that one so this this is all from my side for now and uh, looking forward to the questions from the audience okay okay perfect thank you thank you very much uh, for uh, for insightful um, <clears throat> presentation mr abdul rahim uh, as again time is of the essence we have to without further ado we should um, move on to the second presenter uh, mr asad taki uh, you have the floor now i will be sharing your presentation Sure. Thank you, Akash. And you can start my presentation. Yes. Oh, you can just start it from the first slide. Yes, perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, my name is Asad Taki, and thank you for having me today. I want to be talking about the dry bulk shipping market and what rice traders can do to potentially navigate this hot freight environment. Uh, next slide, please. So just like many asset classes to date, dry bulk freight rates have gone to the moon. And as Subra mentioned in his earlier presentation, the dry bulk index, which is an index that tracks vessel earnings, has shot up from about 400 points in May 2020 to about 3,000 points today, or more than six times. And just for a fun comparison, Bitcoin has only gone up four times during that same time period. Today, vessel earnings are the highest they've been in over a decade and continue to make higher highs. So how did we get here and where are we going? Uh, next slide, please. So to understand today's market cycle, it's first worth understanding the dynamics of the last bull cycle in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, freight rates shot up in large part due to China's staggering economic growth and large appetite for raw materials. And the BDI hit an all-time high of 12,000 points in 2008. Ships were generating huge profits for their owners, and owners in turn ordered way too many new ships, thinking that the party would go on forever. 
And in fact, in 2008, about 80% of the existing fleet was on order from shipyards. And as many of these new ships hit the waters, so too did the global financial crisis and these ships and all these new ships were suddenly not able to find any employment. So since then, there have just been too many ships compared to uses for them. And ship rates have been dwindling, still hung over from the party of the early 2000s. Uh, next slide, please. So the suffering in the dry bulk market has been especially bad in the last few years. In the last three years, dry bulk has been plagued by three black swan events that had, that had pushed rates to unsustainable lows. So in 2019, even before COVID hit, a Vale dam collapsed in Brazil, damaging a large number of iron ore mines in the country. The iron ore trade is arguably the most important dry bulk trade, and these mines going offline wiped out a huge chunk of ship demand. Secondly, there was a major bout of swine flu in China in 2018 and 2019, which decimated almost 50% of the domestic hog population and crippled grain and oilseed demand, causing freight rates to further suffer. And then just to make matters even worse, COVID-19 hit, which was the ultimate black swan event. It didn't just impact iron ore and grain trade, but literally demand for all seaborne commodities. This once in a century pandemic forced most countries around the world into lockdowns, shutting down factories, and therefore demand for ships to, uh, to move raw materials plummeted even more. And as you can see, a combination of all of these uh, factors caused the BDI to trough in May 2020 at 393 points. With uh, earnings at negative levels, ship owners were incurring huge losses and that incentivized scrapping of older tonnage, which helped tip the scales to a more balanced market. So the poor freight environment was an amalgamation of three cataclysmic events happening within, within such a short proximity to each other. And what has been happening since is the demand equation finally playing catch up as these black swan events are finally being resolved simultaneously. Now we have most of the damaged mines reopened, hog populations rebuilding, and the global economy reopening. The trough in the summer of 2020 marks a time when China began to ease some of its lockdown restrictions and it announced a huge uh, mammoth stimulus package of almost $700 billion, which was infrastructure intensive. This led it to import more coal and iron ore for its steel mills. And this did not just lead to a bottoming out of freight indices, but it triggered an aggressive V-shaped rebound. China makes up about 50% of overall seaborne transportation of dry commodities. So when they put forward such measures, it really gets things going. You know, there's that well famous, uh, there's that well known saying that when the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. Well, if you want to turn the phrase, you could easily say when China injects itself with steroids, the shipping market will form some pretty impressive glutes. Uh, next slide, please. And impressive glutes have indeed been formed. Shipping is an economically sensitive cyclical industry. So when the global economy does well, dry bulk does well too, and vice versa. And at the moment, it feels we are recovering from a post-war economy as the world re-emerges from lockdowns. There is pent up demand and with over $10 trillion of aggregate stimulus from accommodative central banks sloshing around and even more expected, uh, global economic growth is on steroids. The IMF is expecting growth of about 6% for 2021 and 4% for 2022. And dry bulk shipping has been a prime beneficiary of this economic backdrop. Also, Ironically, trade wars have helped prop the freight market higher. For instance, China has substantially reduced purchases of Australian commodities due to political tensions, and this has led China to source coal and grain from further afield, such as the Americas and the Black Sea, and this has led to greater ton mile demand. Now, all of these factors have uh, catapulted bulk freights to a decade high. So now the question is, where do we go from here? Is this as good as it gets? or will we head towards the all-time highs of 2008? Uh, next slide, please. So the consensus view of most, most shipping analysts is that they expect freight rates to hit higher highs in the coming years, and this is why. Firstly, there are favorable supply demand dynamics at play. The order book for new building vessels is at a 25 year low of 5% of the existing fleet, whereas foreseeable demand is expected to exceed this. And despite high freight rates, we still have not yet seen owners place many orders for new ships like they did in 2008. And this should keep the freight market relatively tight for the next few years. And this is why it seems that we are only in the early part of the bull market cycle. The reason the order book is still so low is because there are major uh, global environmental policies that will be enforced by the IMO in 2023. And ship owners are not yet sure how to best comply with them. 
Ship owners don't want to be in a position where they order a $50 million new ship and it is not compliant with the new rules. These regulations will require vessels to cut greenhouse emissions drastically. Again, it is currently unclear what, exa what exact actions need to be taken because the rules are not yet ratified. But ship owners will probably have to do a combination of three things. One, substitute from fuel oil to a more expensive, eco-friendly fuel. Two, they will need to spend more capex to make engines more fuel efficient. Or three, they will have to sail slower in order to reduce emissions. And if they cannot do any of these, then they will have to scrap their vessels. And all four scenarios lead to higher freight outcomes. So if they spend more on capex and more fuel and more expensive fuels, then they will pass these costs on to their charters. And if they sail slower or scrap their ships, then this will create an even tighter market. So once the 2023 environmental rules are clear, then owners will likely overorder EEXI compliant ships more than can be absorbed by the market. And then the market will slump as what happened in 2008. But it takes about two years for a shipyard to make a new ship. So that would mean the next slump could come around 2025. So barring another black swan event, it seems as if the stars are aligning for dry bulk and that freight rates will continue to be relatively firm until then. Uh, next slide, please. So if you buy into the thesis that high bulk freights will be a theme over the next few years, then it may perhaps be prudent to adopt some of these strategies. One, uh, make sure you have freight cover when you're making CNF sales. Over the past few years, commodity traders were generally rewarded by being short freight because freight rates were in a downtrend. But I think the playbook needs to be tweaked considering the circumstances. In a market setup where freight is making higher highs, it is perhaps better to limit your freight exposure by seeking cover in advance rather than covering it later on in the spot market. Number two, work on speeding up loading and discharging operations. See, in a high freight environment, every day saved is vital. It usually takes about 15 days to load a ship in Pakistan and about 20 to 40 days to discharge it in West Africa. And based on today's rates, every day wasted at port amounts to $1 of ton of freight. So if you're able to save, save, if you're able to save, say five days both ends by incentivizing stevedores to expedite operations, then you could perhaps save up to $10 per ton, which is probably far less than the cost of giving incentives. And with such big rewards for speeding up operations, you may even save more if you repack rice into jumbo bags or even invest in bulk rice infrastructure, because then this would really reduce the time for loading and discharging even beyond 10 days. Lastly, Bagged rice is at the bottom of the pecking order of what ship owners want to transport because of the high cargo claims associated with the trade. It is not uncommon for a ship owner to be claimed up to $100,000 uh, for alleged cargo claims, and so many owners flat out refuse to transport bagged rice. So perhaps look into assuming cargo claims for your own account and take it off the ship owner's burden by getting an insurance policy against it and by working with your buyer. This way you can incentivize more ship owners to work with you and this may allow you to get a more competitive freight rate. And so on the hopeful note of, uh, more, of more competitive freight rates, I will end this presentation. Thanks all. Thank you all for your time. And Wakas, I'll hand it back over to you. OK, perfect. Uh, it was a very good, um, <clears throat> a very good uh, insightful, again, information, though it uh, did not see a lot of optimism in the freight market. Um, but having said that, I think we should just simply quickly go on to a bit of uh, questions and then um, a bit of questions and we probably try to wrap it up. Um, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Abdul Rahim. Um, it has been more than 18 months since inception of COVID. And I believe that this should be enough time for the inventory levels to stabilize around the globe and phrase to rationalize. When do we see the shipping industry coming back to this normal? Can we point a finger and have a period in mind? Uh, I guess thank you, Vakas, for asking this question. And I guess that's a very relevant question that uh, despite this 18 months, when do we expect this to be normalized? So if we look at the last 18 months, we could, what we could see is basically there are a number of events that is leading to this. It's not something that uh, one event is there that is probably having this for the last 18 months. So there was, you can say, the downside of it for the first two, uh, first two quarters, and then you can say the rebound. And then what we could see is basically severe episodes of like the congestion, like the Swiss Canal event that basically backtracked us. And then if you look at, the, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, that if, what we are looking at is basically the sustained demand growth. So it's not something that the capital investment would be done on, you can say, the short-term demand. 
And once uh, everyone has realized that the demand will continue for the coming few years, now the investment is already run. If you look at the order book right now, so we have like the 200 container ships order book is there in 2021, which was only 120 ships last year uh, and only 114 vessels compared to 2019. So what we can see is basically the right amount of investment is there and it takes around two to three years to build one ship. So it's not something that let's suppose if we order the ship today, it will be into the market tomorrow. So probably for this, all this capital investment, there needs to be a little wait has to be done and then it will be available. Regarding this imbalance of the container, this is probably a mere more of a short term. So from the HEPEC side, if I can comment on this one, so we have ordered 60,000 TUs and that are also under production. So few of them will, will be in the market in July and the majority will be available in the third and fourth quarter of this year. So to overcome the equipment imbalance. So this is what we could see a gradual improvement over the next one or two quarters. Okay, okay. Um, and Mr. Moiz, I would like to ask a question to, to you that as you're sitting in the middle of exporters, shipping lines and dry bulk vessel operators, how do you see the future of shipping and how long will these problems continue? What is the take on all this that we set in? I think you have to unmute yourself, yeah. Mr. Moiz. Okay. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Vakas. I'm Moise uh, from Value Logistics. Uh, as far as your question is concerned, uh, I'll try to go from the customer point of view. I mean, as far as uh, I'll try to go from the shipper's point of view, you know, the situation is. You've heard from uh, Takib Asadbai and uh, Abdul Rahim also, you know, from the shipping line point of view. Uh, to understand what has happened today in uh, especially the containerized shipping, uh, it's not because most of the people think that it's because of the COVID. We're seeing these kind of freight rates, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what is available in the market today. It's not only because of the COVID. You can say COVID can be one of the reasons, but not the COVID entirely. To understand this, you have to go back, you know, a couple of few, few years. Let's say you go back 2016 and 17. There were major changes happening in the shipping, containerized shipping industry. They were mergers and acquisitions. You see Moss Line taking over Hamburg Sud. You see Harper Lloyd joining hands with uh, uh, United, uh, United Arab Shipping. You see Costco taking over China Shipping. You see Hanjin Shipping going bankrupt, which is one of the 10th largest shipping company in the world. Then you see Ch uh, CMA taking over uh, uh, NOL, which is the parent company of American President Line, so APA. So all of these things were happening in between 2016 and 17. So what was the result? The result was the tonnage and capacity rationalization. So the whole thing was already under, in the, in the, under the process. Uh, the shipping lines were basically consolidating everything, especially the overcapacity in the market, which resulted because of the, you know, just like in dry bulk industry between 2002 and 2008 and 9, there were uh, big vessels coming in, post Panamax vessels coming in. Uh, of course, that made an overcapacity in the market for the container shipping. So the process was already going on and then came COVID. So when COVID came, this industry cons consolidation helped and there was only a few handful of shipping lines were there. So it was, it was very easy for them to, you know, uh, maintain the rates and maintain the capacity and the tonnage in the market. So you can see when COVID came, let's say between February and March uh, last year, uh, no, there was no cargo in the market. There was, it was, uh, market was all, all time low. Major markets were closed, but still there was no drop in container rates container rates were maintained. They were maintained, why? Because of past four or five years, shipping lines have played, you know, the way they, uh, uh, through a certain strategy. So the container rates were maintained. So it was what they did, basically blank sailing, skipping the ports and everything. So we saw that the containers were maintained. Then what happened was in June onwards, we saw China opening up and we saw uh, Europe and America going, to, you know, basically the entire world closing down. That 
as Abdul Rahim explained, was one of the reasons of equipment imbalance. And because of this equipment of imbalance and the surging exports coming out of China, you know, the demand suddenly arose and especially the entire world market did not grow the way the American trade grew, uh, almost 10 to 16%. That was one of the reasons the rates went up like crazy. Like for, for example, from China to USA today is something like $8,000 uh, for a 40 foot box. And from China to Europe, it's between $10,000 to $8,000 for a 40 foot box. So, you know, these were the different uh, changes which happened. So uh, uh, from Mr. your Mr. point of, from the shipper's point of view, from the customer point of view, we need to understand one thing. In the middle of all this happening, the customer is the odd man out. He has no choice. He's on the side of, you know, uh, one side negotiations. He has nothing to say. He can't do anything. I'm being very honest and very open the way the situation is working. You need to understand, you see today, it's lightweight, high value cargo versus low value and heavyweight cargo. You see, if a container shipping out of China of electronic goods going into USA at a rate of $10,000, nobody is going to carry a thousand dollar container to Africa. It is as simple as that. So okay. we, these are, uh, you, you see, and we, uh, from Pakistan point of view, uh, you, I can give you an example. This high, weight, high value, low weight cargo and low value, high weight cargo. From Pakistan, the USA exports okay. were last year to, you know, the rate was about $2,000 a 40 to New York last year. Today, it's over $6,000 and still okay. shipping lines have no space. Still, and the market from Pakistan to USA have grown like crazy. That means this kind of freight increase was absorbed by the market because so it was a high value. If you just, but, uh, if you just cut it short and say that- one Yeah, yeah thing, it's done, it's done. What, what I'm um, trying to explain to you that we are here in the situation which is going to stay for another year. It doesn't uh, seems to be going to change. That's what I'm saying. And it's not only because of the COVID, it's uh, the imbalance is there, everything is there, but the situation is not going to change for the you know heavy okay. commodity exporters. Okay, and uh, Mr. Asad, just a quick uh, question and a quick reply before we end wrap it up because time is uh, very short. Uh, uh, we see that a lot of this, this the, the, because of container imbalances that there's a very good uh, opportunity for vessel load business. Did you see a, a spike in vessel business or or not? What 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 is that? Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely been uh, a lot of cargo transfer from uh, containers to dry bulk, as uh, our previous speakers have said as well. So uh, definitely there has been a lot of flows into the bulk sector because primarily because shippers and receivers want a ship to uh, arrive direct and to arrive faster at the destination. So there's absolutely been a lot of spillover into the dry bulk sector, which has been pretty bullish uh, for the dry bulk sector as a whole. Okay, and, and, and is there any, uh, uh, anything for this uh, small 1,000 ton, 2,000 ton loads of uh, container people who can who get slots or something in, in vessel business? Yeah, look, is I mean, there are companies that do that. They parcel smaller uh, cargoes together into a ship load. Personally, we don't do this, but there are many, there are a few companies that do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, we can try and of course uh, assist as much as, as much as we can. And even if we can't assist, then we can obviously also guide shippers who maybe don't have any experience with dry bulk as to what terms to put in their charter party so people can understand their rights and obligations when they do fix a cargo with the ship owner. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much for all the, all the, pan to the, all the panelists. Um, it has been a very good learning session and I'm sure for the audience, but as much as you want to continue with it, again, time is of the essence. And this presents us to the closed session. We see that the resurgence of COVID with waves is definitely one of the causes of this shipping uh, uh, situation not improving. As we learned that the poor um, freight environment was an amalgamation of three characteristic events and then demand and uh, pushing up uh, causing problems. We also foresee a bullish freight rate market, which is not something positive for the shippers. But uh, having said that, being an optimist myself, uh, I believe to be positive for a better future and expect that things will improve as we hope to see that shipping lines will and vessel operators increase their equipment vessels in order to meet the ever-increasing demand. On this note, let us close the session. Um, take care, stay home, stay safe. Thank you very much. Jazakallah, Khairun. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you very much.